So we, what we are going to talk about today, uh, as you know, with the with Gentlemen. the panel aim is data disruption. There is just a lot of data all around, whether it's about data or data-driven uh, products. So what we have put together is a very um, interesting panel here. All of them are actually representing different industries. And some are working in corporate, and some are funding the companies, and some are actually building the products and services. So it's going to be an interesting talk about what they're seeing, uh, how they're learning from the data, and how they're uh, making changes in their current ventures. And also, what are some lessons you can take from this panel in terms of uh, what's going in the next 12 months uh, regarding the data, especially in their industries? So. I would just right away dive into the questions, and um, there is so you guys can see who is who, and uh, so so Preeta, we'll start from you. The question what I was looking for uh, in terms of what uh, all of you, if you could share a little bit about what you're doing in your current venture or in the past venture, where you were leveraging the data to put together a product or a service. So what are you doing right now? And how, what is the role of the data in, in that particular venture? So let's start with you, Preeta. Thanks, Shilpi. OK, awesome. Um, so I'm um, the CEO of Open Study. And in the past, I've also been um, the, the, the dean for science at Emory University. So I see myself as a technologist who plays in the education space. So I'm going to talk to you with those perspectives. Um, Open Study is um, the world's largest peer study help platform. We get over millions of, you know, between two to three million uh, uh, users a month, learners a month. And what's unique about this is that we connect these learners not to content, but to people so that they can get help. And we do this because we believe that a question is a cry for help. And so we've managed to turn on that altruism gene in people so that they're able to come and help in millions. But um, what keeps them there is the game mechanics. And all of this stuff, it works because we have a very sophisticated data analytics engine behind all of the stuff. So you said, how do we use this in our site? We gather user data about everything, every action, every question, every, you know, every interaction, whether it's social or not. And we're able to therefore understand our users. We segment them. And with this information, we surface power users. We prioritize product roadmaps based on this understanding. We improve the user experience and optimize revenue streams. So an example of how we do this, so the analytics that we've been looking at on our site has actually fueled our disruptive thinking about education. I know that's a part of what's, what you're going to ask us later on. Um, so for example, we go beyond grades. For us, we know your employers. And when you hire people, you're not just hiring them based upon their grades in college or, or school. So we know we want a better skills assessment something that relies on whether they're good problem solvers, whether they can do teamwork, whether they're engaged. And so with the data, with over 40 social and behavioral analytics that we have on the data, we've developed a product which we call the Smart Score, which reports on these three. And with that, we empower our learners on our site to apply for college, to apply for internships or, or jobs. And so that's where data has been very critical in what we do. Hi, I'm Jocelyn Goldfein, and at present I'm a full-time angel investor, but uh, in my, my previous life I have spent most of my career as an engineer leading engineering teams at VMware and then at Facebook. And I would say at VMware we used data mainly in very qualitative ways. We, were, we sold big enterprise software, we had big enterprise sales, we visited customers, we listened deeply to them, we incorporated their feedback into our products. When I got to Facebook, it was total culture shock. We, you know, we barely ever talked to users, except in the sense that we really all were users, and as so was everybody we knew. Um, but, but it was nonetheless the most user-driven and user-informed company I'd ever worked for by far, because every single product decision, every single design decision we took, um, was A/B tested, was informed by the metrics of how users responded to it. Um, and now, as an angel investor, I'm able to apply some of that learning both to individual startups in my portfolio that are are leveraging data, for example, to help um, match up job candidates with job openings, um, a mobile retail shopping application to 
determine what promotions are going to drive more repeat usage, more customer growth. Um, and I'm actually invested in several data infrastructure companies that are not necessarily data driven themselves, but that are creating the new, new tools that are, that are enabling this wave of, of data disruption. So I'm, I'm very interested in all angles of this question. I'm Ritu Narayan, I'm founder of Zoom. Zoom is a leading uh, ride sharing company for kids. We provide uh, very high trustworthy, 100% reliable rides and care for kids. And data is the reason actually we founded Zoom. So just to set a context, and all, many of you in the room can relate to it, I was working at eBay and my kids, then three and eight, both transitioned to school. And suddenly I had this complexity of being in three or four places at the same time. And I looked around all the solutions, all the ride sharing solutions, and I found two main issues. One was all of them were sending random people every time, causing a huge churn for my family. And second thing was all of them were point A to B, and none of them provided care around the rides. And that's how we came up with the concept of uh, Zoom. And I was like, at eBay, using the data and the marketplace, we are changing the lives of millions of people. Why can't we have very trustworthy marketplace for ride sharing and care uh, for the kids? At Zoom, we use data to provide very high trust and safety and uh, ease of use and personalization. Uh, in terms of trust and safety, it's not just the background checking and vetting, which we, of course, do 100%, but we go way beyond it in terms of monitoring the feedback that we are getting on the platform and what's happening, different data points and actions and feedback that we are getting. But how we go way beyond is in terms of personalization of the solution, and we provide a small pool of drivers, so we have a very unique matching and optimization process where families have continuity and consistency in terms of a small pool of drivers, and that also lead to a very high satisfaction from the driver side of it. I'll explain to you more as we go through the panel. Look forward to it. All right. I am Satyam Priyadarshi. Currently, I am the chief data scientist at Halliburton, and I'm also the first chief data scientist for oil and gas industry. Uh, this is my fourth data science team in my career that I'm building. So I can t talk about a lot about data-driven life, basically. <laughs> right. Now I started uh, pretty much an academic world where I did my PhD in quantum physics, applied to biophysics and then turned into a technologist at AOL, and that's where I built my first machine learning or pre-Hadoop cluster to integrate data from multiple places uh, to make some sense for advertising revenues in real time. All right, and then built on some other companies, built some startups uh, in retail space, all data-driven. But currently, one of the most interesting earlier in the panel, somebody was talking insurance industry is ready for disruption. I'll tell you, oil and gas industry is Way like way important for disruption. There's a if you believe, last year there was a report early 2015 that uh, oil and gas industry only uses one percent of the data they generate. So now there's 99 percent of the data that's sitting idle. That's what I call dark data. And if you think of it, there are so many ways to do it. And um, it's not just about leveraging the just big data technologies. There's a lot more value to be generated, especially if you know now the oil price has crashed and it impacts everybody, not just uh, consumers. But it's not about the price, it's actually creating innovation. The thing that I focus on is trying to f tell people that it's uh, leveraging the data for return on innovation rather than return on investment. So if you talk about return on investment, then you can do all your business intelligence and live with it. It's about the industry which actually is highly scientifically based, engineering based, but they have not actually created data-driven models, and there's a significant value in it. So we'll talk more about it in the panel. Thank you, Satyam, and thank you, uh, Preeta, Ritu, and Jocelyn. So let's dive into a more personal question, and it's more about your companies and your products and services. Uh, as an entrepreneur, when we start a journey, we have n different directions to go to, right? We are building a product, we are building a service, there is a competition, there is a market demand, but at the same time, you need to focus, right? So. A lot of time for an entrepreneur, data is really important, with whether it's about their pilot implementation, whether that's, that's about the initial set of customers. Would love to know from all of you that if there are any examples that you would like to share, that how you saw those initial set of data points and try to uh, change the direction strategically for your company or for your product. 
Thanks, Shilpi. So, as you said, data is actually very key to decision making and for any kind of a company. Um, for us in the learning space, we look at macro data and micro data. So it can be as micro as, is this learner improving in math or not? Or it could be macro like, um, what topics are bothering students in October in US history? You know, it could be as macro as that. Or on our site, we have a virtual economy, so it could be um, which users, which user behavior to incentivize so that they will level up faster. Um, should we incentivize askers? Should we incentivize answerers? Um, or, you know, and, and in our virtual economy, you can also um, make money. So it is which user should be allowed from their profiles to charge for the help that they're giving. So these are all questions that have a definite business impact and affect the product roadmap. But I want to share with you one of our early stories since you asked me about the story. Um, when, we, when we started, we, um, our, our biggest fan at that time, um, our first, and our, we've had a love affair with them for the longest time, was MIT. So with MIT as our partner, we were then able to sign on other universities as partners, Yale, Michigan, Northwestern. And so we were getting traffic from them. And as our popularity grew, we were also started getting traffic from the open internet, search, you know, Google, people just looking for help and finding it on our site. So the thing about analytics is that it does reveal use differences in user behavior. And you know, different users will behave differently. And when you have a data engine, it will give you answers, but only if you ask it the right question. So what were we going to ask our big data engine? So we asked our big data engine, we've got these two sets of users, one from our partners and one from search. Is there any difference in them? And of course, the business question is, what should we do about that if there is a difference? And our big data engine very wisely said, yes, there is a difference. Of course, it comes down to their behavior on the site, their activity, their engagement, and all of that. And based on that, we decided, and we made a critical business decision at that time, which led into our growth hack as, as to how we would grow in the future. We went after the open search market and prioritized that in our roadmap. So that was a, a pivotal moment in the history of open study, and it was all because of our big data engine. Well, I think um, maybe the most widely interesting anecdote I have to tell about data-driven product decisions comes from Facebook. How many of you are Facebook users? How many of you have Facebook open right now? That's fine. Um, so uh, I, was, I was responsible for the new version of Newsfeed that shipped in um, 2011 that switched from you had a choice between a ranked and a chronological feed into a purely ranked feed. And we got tons and tons of user feedback that um, users preferred chronological ordering. How many of you prefer or would prefer a chronically, uh, chronologically ordered newsfeed? So, all right, a goodly number. And how many of you prefer the ranked feed? Almost none. And most of you don't care. Okay, so um, our, our numbers at the time were that um, you know, when people had a choice between the two that sort of, you know, 40% of users used one and 40 used another and another further 20% used both of them interchangeably. Um, so we thought there was value in, in chronology, but, but we also thought there were benefits to ranking, especially for dealing, handling larger and larger. We made the switch really to handle sort of ever-growing volume of stories in the feed. And um, what we saw when we switched to not just a ranked feed, but, one, but also the ranking was driven off of machine learning. Um, was that user engagement soared, that clicks, likes, and comments went up. And, um, and yet we had this vocal minority of users who were very upset that, that chronology wasn't there. Um, and, and, and we revisited this decision again and again because those users were so adamant that, hey, maybe the majority, vast majority of users prefer a ranked feed, but we really need chronology. And we ran test after test. And for those of you who believe you prefer a chronological news feed, I'm sorry to tell you, but you don't. <laughs> or rather, your behavior does not exhibit that you do. Um, and so we, the tests that we ran didn't just dump a set of users into a chronological feed. Like the tests gave users a widget, that they, a button they had to press, a switch they had to flip to put themselves. So this, this test was only testing users who went out of their way, who worked very hard to put themselves into a chronological feed. And then again and again, the numbers came back very consistently that in a chronological feed world, 
Um, time on site went down, clicks went down, likes went down, comments went down, went down. So it's hard to see how that chronological feed can be better for you as a user when you're liking fewer things, when you're commenting on fewer things. But frankly, even if that does represent, you know, for you a more efficient use of your time or, or whatever it may be, like it also damages the network very badly because that's the people who would have received those likes and comments now don't get them if you're less engaged. So we really, um, as much as we took a ton of heat for it, we stayed, um, we stayed, we kept conviction about a ranked feed. Um, and I think this is one of those things that you sort of, if you didn't have the data um, to drive the decision and you didn't have the capacity to run the tests, um, it would be really hard to figure this out from first principles. But it turns out, you know, if you're curious why this is true, it turns out that the reason it's true is because our time and attention are concentrated um, exponentially towards the top 10 stories and even more towards the top one or two stories. And so if you allow those those spots, those, those prime real estate spots to be filled with stories of a random quality, which is essentially what you get with chronology, um, as opposed to like the, the story that has a best chance of eliciting a like or a comment from you, then, then you're just sacrificing a tremendous amount of user engagement. Um, so it was quite a difficult strategic decision. It's one we revisited over and over with, you know, I have felt bitterly torn in both directions. Um, but ultimately, it's one whose, uh, whose efficacy can be seen in, in Facebook's current numbers. Yes. So Zoom actually solves a problem. Uh, we right from the beginning knew that we wanted to solve everyday problem for the parents. Uh, parents have the need of a solution at least two times, if not more. So our biggest challenge was how do we engage and provide such a high trust environment and personalized service to the parents that they're ready to use us every day. So when we looked at that, a lot of parents initially used to ask us, like, can, can I get a dedicated driver? <laughs> and that solution is not scalable. But at the same time, data and research showed us that the random people showing up every time was not the right solution for the parents, and they would never use it every day if that was a solution. So we essentially use data in three different ways. Uh, first, we, ha we are the only ride-sharing company that doesn't auction the ride. We have a very unique matching and optimization process on our platform. And we take a bunch of data points to assign a small pool of drivers or providers, as we call them, uh, to the families. And what, in turn, it results is, what it means for the family is, if they are taking our service over a period of four to five months, they would act at the most see three people, maybe. Uh, and that's huge, because now people use us on an ongoing and recurring basis. There's more consistency and continuity for the family. When kids every day see their provider, they're very happy, they're greeted, and drivers have less mistakes, because they are familiar with the routines and other things. Second area that we use the data is essentially reducing the learning curve of our providers on our platform. So we are very... Uh, crazy about storing the various information and how we use. And at multiple level, we try to reduce the learning curve. One is location is the key. Everything is happening in the real time. These kids are there at the school. They're at the activities. Every, every school or activity has a different process of check-ins and check-outs. And having a familiarity for every single person who's going, even when there is a small pool, is a big challenge. So we store a lot of information about the routines of the families, kids, schools, process and procedures, and use that data to project it at the right moment, at the right time, so that if there is 100% reliability and very less delay and mistakes that happen on our platform. And third, actually, the most important and one of the very important is we are very uh, provider-friendly or driver-friendly company too, and our drivers tell us that they are all childcare providers, they all come from childcare background, and they tell us they want predictable income, they want predictable schedule. They are unlike Uber or Lyft drivers uh, who will go any time, any place to any place. And these are all childcare providers who want to work in certain times, they want certain income, minimum income. So what we have done on our platform is we ensure very high utilization uh, using data. Instead of auctioning the rides and randomly having, having them picked up, we actually assign the rides to them. We ensure very little idle time. And at the same time, we do the match in a way there's a very high satisfaction and loyalty on the platform. So all in all, by doing all of these uh, three things together, what we have done is we have built a personalized and relationship using data between the communities, between the, on a driver side and the family side. It's almost like a big 
personalized solution at a scale for the families. So the industry I do is much more complex than many of the industries we talked about. And I've li lived my life in this technology world before. So about seven different verticals, if you want to think of, to bring them together. That's the challenge. That's exploration, right? Just to give you the data sizes, currently for one square kilometer, we get multi terabytes. And in a few years, we'll be getting five petabytes of data for just one square kilometer of uh, seismic study. And trying to build data-driven models on it, and then building the visualization on top of it, which can be actually interpreted as like what reservoir is there that we can actually pull the oil from. Uh, it's all very, very complex. So not only we look at just the scientific side of it, but we also look at what technology platform to build with it. So just one part, drilling operations, we deploy anywhere from 2,000 to 40,000 sensors on a given field. Each sensor is different, right? Then we also have chemistry data. So a person who is actually doing data scientist job, they not only have to know how to actually just pull the data from ETL perspective or ELT perspective, but also at the same time knowledgeable about what kind of science is going into it, what kind of domain we are talking about. Can I actually connect the data from the geochemistry to the uh, seismic study to the drilling sensors? And if you think of these data sets are all diverse. There are roughly about 3,000 different plus uh, data sets that are available, and each comes in different shape, form, variety kind of thing. So building something on that, any data-driven model, is a very, very complex process. And on top of it, we can't do any, we don't claim to do any prediction to 100% accuracy, because there's no way you can do it, because everything under the subsurface, as they call it, below the Earth, is every, anybody's guess. It's all based on some scientific physics formulas on which we actually build the subsurface. And based on that, we try to predict where we can drill. And if you talk about fracking, so multiple channels of fracking has to take place. That requires uh, a lot more understanding as we progress into the drilling phase. So it has to be done a lot of real-time modeling. And so behavior aspects, unlike our human behavior aspects that we can do from clickstream data, is not possible from the drilling operations because it changes the moment you think that you have, you have actually uh, uh, drilled two feet and you, you would have rocks of this kind, it might totally change because the rock might have cracked behind you. So this is, this is like real time behavioral analytics which is much more complex. Uh, so we, what we do is like, you know, take, take data at a time. One of the other challenges unlike internet world is we don't get the data because the data from the field we can't push at, at the speed that we want to push because it's very expensive. Right, so we actually bring sample data, then try to build on it, then we get more data. It's a very highly complex process, so uh, this is why I think this industry requires a completely a different uh, technology paradigm and also an integration uh, aspect of it to actually build value into it. Thanks, Satya. Well, I think uh, next question is kind of related what you just talked about. So I, I see that oil and gas is just starting with data, right? Like you said, only 1%. And one comment I'll say, no, the oil and gas industry has always had data. No, we, to create innovation, they have the used use, to, The yeah. use of data yeah. is just starting, yeah. right? Yeah. So in terms of, uh, like you, all four of you are representing uh, different industries. and. It's not that these are new use cases. I'm not talking about oil and gas that much, but you know, open study, the social network, matching driver and, and you know, parents. So all of those kind of things are happening today. And, but everybody comes with a different angle to try to optimize one particular thing and do it really good so that it differentiates from other services. So when it comes to your industry, where do you see in next 12 months uh, the most of the data uh, disruption, the innovation that is going to come through data disruption, and how this industry is going to look like, because what we are talking about it's today. So it must be there must be some plan for you. The trends you're seeing, uh, the competition that you're seeing in the market. So where do you think we will be sitting in here after 12 months and talking about it? That's a super exciting question, Shubhi. So. For education, everybody knows um, <clears throat> there's a lot of disruption in the system right now because education is a numbers game. And what I predict is that big data 
is actually going to change all the rules of the game in the next 12 months or and, and beyond. So take a look at the three numbers that matter most for education. There's three numbers. One of them is the cost of education. The second one is the graduation rate. And the third one is the unemployment rate. And right now, all these, these three numbers for the education industry are pretty unsatisfactory. And that's what's spurring on a lot of the innovation and the disruption in, in, the, in the system. So what you're going to see, Shilpi, is in the next 12 months, if not sooner, companies innovating around these three numbers, trying to improve them. And a lot of the improvement, a lot of the change is going to happen because of the power of data. So I'll give you an example. If you think of the first one that I talked about cost, everyone, just about everybody's heard about MOOCs. So MOOCs, you know, massively open online courses are doing, have been working on the issue of cost, trying to bring down the cost of an Ivy League course, for example. So MOOCs, the thing about them is that they're macro enrollment, but micro retention. <laughs> so, thank you, Jocelyn. <laughs> so, and companies are trying to improve that. You know, you have the Udacity and the Coursera for two of the big names, but there's plenty of room for the other companies to innovate around that. And they will do that by looking at the analytics around user behavior, um, retention, time on site, collaboration online. All of these things are going to go into improving and coming up with new assessment models, new perhaps even grading models, and they're going to feed right into this question of how do we bring the cost down. The second number is graduation. Why aren't our kids graduating? And it's 58% right now, which means, and that's an average number. So after all of the cost that has gone in, 58% graduation is not great. So there's a lot going on, but my bet, and for this audience, my bet is on personalization. So personalization is like your teen has a personalized iTunes playlist. So down the line, I predict he or she is also going to have a personalized school playlist that is tuned just exactly for him. And I think you're going to see that sooner rather than later because you're seeing it in places like the summit schools here in the valley, the alt schools in New York. There's a schools for one. Zuckerberg recently put a lot of his money into summit and alt schools, so it's, go it's going to go somewhere. And, um, and so what personaliza personalization is about is taking this concept that every child is different and there are different parts in their learning journey. So why can't we take the macro data that we have about children and come up with a micro curriculum? So I predict, Shilpi, that we're going to see the demise of the one-size-fits-all education. And I see these, these signs in front of me, so I'll just turn this over to you, Jocelyn. <laughs> All right, well, then maybe who, we should just... Who this man? All right. <laughs> So I don't know if I can stick to the 12-month prediction, but I think in terms, I'll, I'll make two predictions, one in terms of um, capability and one I think in terms of outcomes. So in terms of capability, I think a huge limiting factor for data science right now is that when we talk about big data, we are not talking about real time. These are batch jobs that take hours or days. And when we talk about real time analytics like the oil and gas industry that, that Dr. Satya was talking about, um, you've got a sample. So you, you have a choice between small data real time or big data batch. And I think that in the next two to three years, we are going to see breakthroughs both in the hardware and the platform side that are going to let us do large volumes of data in real time. And that's going to be an immense breakthrough across many, many industries. And I will stop there. <laughs> So uh, what our, uh, we are trying to solve the problem of families. Life of the families is still really cluttered. In next 12 months, what we see is seamless integration between how the services are ordered, services are delivered. Uh, we are just at the one use case right now. So that's what we are looking at, recommending, just like you ask a question to Alexa, the same way we recommend what your kid should be doing, where they should be going, transportation is all booked, care is all booked, and the job of a parent is not so much planning, organizing, researching, but more of approving and having a visibility. So Thank that's you. What. 
I'll only make, make one statement. The only area that we will focus for next 24 years is production optimization. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your time. And I hope uh, people got to hear some new ideas here.